Hi everyone. Our guest today is the Chief Digital Officer for Active Wellness. He's been distinguished as a health influencer by various organizations. Um, Dr. Rucker's academic background is in organizational psychology. Um, and four years ago, this is what we're going to talk about today. Four years ago, he set off to study the science of fun. Who would have thought that, that fun could be scientific? Uh, <laughs> and this has resulted in his upcoming book, The Fun Habit. And Mike, in his book, is going to be making the argument that we should cultivate fun to bring a greater sense of happiness and joy to our lives. That's so interesting because people, I think, associate that, ha that fun is always something that's going to make you happy or happiness is what makes you fun. And I'm really interested to hear what your, your take is on how they are connected. Um, sure. The Fun Habit is set to release through Simon & Schuster in late 2021. And another reason I wanted to talk to, can I call you Mike? Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> Dr. Mike? <laughs> um, yeah, another reason I wanted to talk to Mike is because uh, when I saw what he stood for, it was so similar to um, my belief system and, and what I believe in. And really how, I mean, I've been living my entire life just doing what I think you are teaching in your book. It just kind of came naturally to me to, have fun. And I never realized there was so much science behind it. So um, I guess the first question I'd, I'd love to ask you is why um, four years ago, something must have changed in your life. Um, why was it four years ago that you just decided to study the science of fun? Yeah. So um, what happened was my little brother unexpectedly passed away. So previous to that, um, I have always been sort of uh, fascinated with positive psychology. I, um, through serendipity, um, uh, back in the early 2000s, got access to a gentleman by the name of Michael Gervais. He was at the time kind of uh, had just started his clinical practice. He's now the sports psychologist for the Seattle Seahawks. So um, he's kind of made a name for himself since then in the mindfulness space. Mm -hmm. um, but I just got lucky to have early access to him. And the reason why that's important is, you know, he sort of fostered this, uh, you know, desire to learn a lot in that space. It was the same time that Marty Seglman uh, launched Authentic Happiness. So, you know, Cheek Set Me High had written Flow, I think, a few years prior. But, um, you know, this idea of positive psych as a movement um, was just developing. And so I became a charter member of the International Positive Psych uh, the IPPA, International Positive Psych Association, um, and, you know, really got interested in everything that sort of pervade through that channel, uh, you know, things that we all talk about, gratitude, you know, mindfulness, the idea of savoring, um, and those had served me fairly well, uh, you know, to build resilience and, uh, you know, live a uh, fulfilling, happy life. Um, but then in 2016, actually, there was this trifecta of things that had happened. My brother unexpectedly passed away from a pulmonary embolism. Um, I was a, a lifelong runner, or not lifelong, but I picked up running as a way to alleviate stress and found out that um, uh, just pretty, pretty much all of a sudden found out that I had uh, advanced osteoarthritis and I wasn't going to be able to run again. So at the age of 46, I had to get a hip replacement. Um, and then, uh, this isn't really necessarily negative, but, um, you know, my wife, um, had supported me for quite some time in, in my doctoral work. Um, and that kind of, uh, pinned us down in the Bay area. Um, and right towards the tail end of that, she got a, um, really great opportunity, um, in North Carolina where we live now. Um, but that did mean, uh, you know, uprooting, uh, basically from her support systems and moving across the country. Wow. So, yeah, it was a lot. And, wow. um, you know, so I had all these tools and, you know, I was like, you know, trying to use them effectively to sort of pull myself out of this space. Mm -hmm. And it dawned on me that I didn't necessarily want to identify as happy, like that dissidence of, you know, wait, you know, I, I need this period to be able to mourn, you know, different aspects, one, my identity changing and two, the fact that, you know, I lost a loved one but I didn't necessarily want to wallow, you know, because that's not who I was. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I knew certain aspects that we all have agency, you know, sort of self-help married with some of the academic literature. Um, yeah. And I wanted to, uh, you know, being 
you know, a good doctoral student wanted to see, you know, what was available in there. So started searching PubMed um, and found that there was this huge research gap in this idea of fun. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we look at happiness from an academic standpoint, it really is a social construct. We now have kind of moved away from quote unquote calling it happiness, although you still see that, you know, in sort of airplane or excuse me, airport books and things of that nature, but they moved on to calling it subjective well-being because it really is measured by instruments, right? You know, like when we talk about, you know, the Nordic of being the happiest place in the planet, that's because people have defined what happiness is, um, you know, and, you know, we take these surveys and, and someone tells us we're either happier or not. Yeah. Um, but fun is really something that we own, right? You know, what's fun for one person isn't fun for the other. Um, you know, it's this emotional state, um, you know, in the most simplest terms, we often talk about it, uh, you know, being the crux between arousal and valence. And, um, you know, most people know what arousal is, but valence really quick is just either something that's positive or negative, right? So we say something's either on the negative side of valence or the positive side. So if we're, you know, in a pleasurable or enjoyable situation, we're usually, you know, somewhere on the positive side and, you know, something that makes us sad, we're on the negative side. And then, you know, you have something like clinical depression, you know, you're sort of stuck in a negative valence state. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be in a positive valence state without sort of, you know, saying, hey, I'm happy because I wasn't. And that was, you know, and I realized that not a lot of people talked about it. There's a lot about uh, you know, research that comes out of education, because we certainly know that fun is tied to, um, you know, better cognition and memory and things of that nature. And if you can keep kids engaged, you know, they tend to, you can expand their attention span, but, you know, yeah. fun yeah. and, and adulting. About that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, kind of what you're getting at is that fun and adulting, you know, there isn't a lot you know, because I think especially in Western culture, um, it's not valued. And yet, um, we know, uh, you know, sort of at the outskirts of this research that there is a ton of upside, you know, one of the ones that's been explored, um, primarily because IDEO and design thinking has gotten so popular, is this idea that, uh, you know, if we're not kind of in this fun space where we're more open minded, um, that we tend to, you know, have these guardrails that don't allow us to be creative. And so um, I could really jump in anywhere, but that's the, I, you know, the long-winded answer to your question. Yeah, no, I can see, like, there's a passion there, and that's what kind of drove you. There was a, um, I think what I see is that you're, you were always a very optimistic person, but then you find yourself in this place where, yeah, you're just not happy. Well, how many people feel that way, right? And they don't, make the association with fun. So I guess on that note, I have two questions um, to what you've said. Do you believe you have to be happy to have fun? I think I know the answer. No. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I feel like I have answered that. Yeah. Um, you know, you can certainly, um, you know, and there are these distinctions, right? This is where I, I think we get caught up with language. And so that's part of the nuance, right? And the yeah. delineation I like to make is that, you know, happiness is really a state where you have to reflect, like, am I happy? Which, and it's important, right? Because, you know, you live in despair or depression, you need to figure out sort of what are the aspects, you know, whether they're biological or circumstantial, you know, and sort of address that. But fun is something that we have in our toolbox that we can do um, at any given time. And so the way I would answer that is, no, you don't need to be. I've certainly proved that. Um, but, uh, you know, it could butt up against your personal definition of, um, you know, what happiness is. Because fun really is experiential. It's, it's similar to flow in the sense that when you're in it, you're just in it. And you don't really need to think about anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, where it's different is, you know, flow is certainly a, a state. And so there's a delineation between those two. Um, but uh, the short answer is no, I think that's, you know, that's kind of the upside of it is if you find yourself um, not happy that you still have access to this and you don't necessarily have to be, you know, it's like uh, a common example are old friends that are at a funeral, right, and still are laughing about, you know, and having fun reminiscing about the good times. But, you know, if you ask them if they're happy about this, you know, their circumstances that, you know, unless they have a personality disorder, you yeah. know, <laughs> um, 
And another thing I like to, the distinction is like, you know, happiness tends to be something that we look at as part of our identity, um, where fun is really an action. And so one of the things that I talk about a lot is that if we have this, you know, sort of uh, external focus on happiness, sometimes it can lead to further despair because we now, you know, ruminate on the gap. Like, you know, I want to be happy, but I'm not. And then so you start to self-identify that, you know, you look at the distance between where you are now and where you want to be. Where fun, you can immediately start to make gains, right? It's like, okay, well, I'm not having fun this week. How can I change my circumstance, right? Because you, you can't, you know, it's um, folly and there's a lot of good, you know, thought uh, research on, you know, trying to tell someone, especially someone who's biologically depressed, like, you know, just flip the switch, be happy, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Most of us can go figure out what is enjoyable and start to do that. And then if you develop that as a process, then you can start to celebrate the gains, right? So you start to look at wow, okay, last week I wasn't having any fun. This week I was having fun. And that has nothing to do with identity. That's really just, you know, starting to celebrate the fact that you do have some agency. And then what you find is over time, you know, it's not something that happens overnight, but you're like, you know, slowly but surely you are now a fun person, which, you know, hopefully, you know, that uh, one of the side effects of that is that you also become happier. Well, then in that way, yeah, you're, you've already answered a number of my questions about fun being able to be something to, to learn because I think um, what you mentioned, how one per I have always struggled with this too. One person's fun, like they all have fun doing that, is another person's nightmare. They're like, ah, like they would never want to do that and that's not fun. Um, what, so what would, you, what would you say to somebody that's, I think that adults, first of all, have this idea of fun and that fun is frivolous and that fun doesn't have a place in our adult lives. Fun is for children, like I mentioned, being a teacher. Yes, absolutely. And just leave it behind. And we're like, we want to call it fulfillment because we're adults <laughs> now. And that's the adult word. Um, right. But really, what would you advise somebody who's feeling so stuck, you know, maybe stuck in their work. They're not having fun at work. They're not having fun in their lives. They're not even having fun raising their children because it's so much work or whatever it is. And I think we get stuck in our heads thinking it's, it's not possible. Like what, I'm just going to do one activity and it's going to make me happy. And we get really right. psyched yeah. in our thinking. And then there's also the element of our, our egos stopping us from, from Absolutely. moving forward. Like there's so much that goes on obviously, but maybe you can speak to that. No, I meant, and it's multifaceted, right? So you're absolutely right. It, it needs a reframe, right? So, um, you know, people, uh, that is a common sort of ailment is that, you know, I'm now an adult, so I don't have time for this, right? Yes, and yeah. So you can't change have, that. Over. I don't have time for fun, but I want to be happy. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, what's worse, this is going to be a bit of a tangent, so I'll reel myself in. I've gotten better at that, is that, <laughs> you know, then what you do is you start to um, overconsume hustle porn, right? It's like, well, um, you know, Simon Sinek says that I need to find my why. So that's just another thing that I can do, you know, because if I find my passion, then all of this stuff is going to get solved, right? Right. But what we know now is that if you don't have any slack in your system, whatever your system is, I, I love the 168 hour sort of framework because it's easy to understand, but you know, it, make something that's meaningful for you right yeah. um, but you know if there is no slack in that right again I'm going to use 168 hours like if if there isn't if you can't find two or three hours within your week that is for you that's pleasurable so like if you don't want to call it fun you want to call it pleasure you right. know whatever it is um, then yeah. you're gonna ultimately burn out you know and we just know that I mean that is clear now you know the World Health Organization you know, identified burnout as a significant problem even before COVID. Um, and so to take, you know, just a couple hours for yourself to figure out what that is, you know, what, what fun is for you, um, you'll start to see it, it immediate benefits. And where it becomes complicated, to your point, is that what does fun mean, right? So yeah. I'll give it's one example. Fun. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I'll get, in my opinion, it needs to be redefined for adults. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think, you know, for me in the book, I, um, 
I, I defined it simply just so that we could start in the most simplest terms. And that's anything on the positive side of valence, because I yeah. think you're seeing a whole bunch of, uh, you know, interesting, uh, you know, compromises, especially, you know, as a parent, I have two small kids and you see a lot of parents thinking that playing with their kids, having, you know, watching them have fun, you know, fits in that category, but then you ask them to be honest and, you know, it was just another sense of duty. They, they yeah. weren't having fun yeah. and they're, they're really easy tweaks you can do to fix that. But, you know, so often, because we all feel overwhelmed like that, you know, that's where you have to ask yourself, you know, and another might be, you know, that's not parent related is, you know, an hour of scrolling on Instagram, like it might have been, you know, uh, you might have assumed it was pleasurable, but it was a very passive experience where, yeah, yeah. you know, um, so one of the things that, uh, that I like to talk about is this idea of like going in and investigating whether or not, um, you know, what you're doing it is pleasurable. And oftentimes, yeah, you peel that back and it's not. And, you know, that simple awareness um, is enough. You know, okay, let, let me try that. Let me figure out what's one or two things that I can do in a given week to sort of reclaim that, you know. Yeah, well, and I even challenge people that I work with, especially in their work environments or if I'm coaching, um, just as a recent example, you know, um, I won't make it specific, but gentleman is working like crazy hours on this project, working on this project and doesn't know, can't find the solution, can't find the solution. Okay, so hours and hours and hours, but his dilemma is that my 18 and 19 year old sons are coming home and I want to spend time with them, but I can't, I can't because I've got so much stuff to do. So I just said to him, and this is, this is what fun is to me, why don't you ask the boys? Why don't you just have a conversation with them? Tell, your, tell them you're stressed out and worried about work and give them the project. Show them what you're working on. Invite them in. And he did that. And you know what? He had fun. <laughs> yes, it's just the word. But he was like, oh my gosh, that was the most enjoyable time of my week because A, it brought me closer to my kids. They are understanding what I'm going through. We, st we started brainstorming. They had like, youthful different solutions that he would never have thought of and you know to challenge yourself in your day-to-day -day, I don't think uh, like the message I want to say is that fun it, it doesn't have to look like you know um, even I'm going for a bike ride that may be fun for some people it doesn't even have to be just on your lunch break my my whole idea is how can we infuse fun into the workplace and yeah. redefine it that way so so that you know, investing a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars into your company in this, 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 and this area, that's going to be fun. Cause can't you wait <laughs> to see what's going to happen? And of course we get, we get fearful and like, Ugh! we, 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 uh, freeze up and it's like, that's scary. But I want to challenge people to say, could it be fun? You know, mm -hmm. could it be fun to tell your kids that what's really going on? You know, and just, um, I think it's a very different way of thinking about that word. Um, so I'd love to ask you, Mike, in the workplace then, um, <clears throat> in your research and in just all of the things that you know, do you think fun has a, a place in corporate America, in working environment? How and what do you think the benefits of the outcomes would be for an organization if they were to allow their employees to have fun or even encourage it, go one step further and be the, the industry or the leaders in their industry that actually encourage them to have fun. Yeah, so I really liked your example because one of the things that's even been a hard pill for me to swallow because you know my academic background's in organizational psych and like so a lot of the tools in our toolbox are like you know yeah. icebreakers and things <laughs> like that that are really contrived, right? And um, there's been some really great research recently that suggests that a lot of those things that you think are inclusive are actually doing damage, especially to introverts, right? Yes. So um, I love the, you know, your idea with the father and the sons where, you know, you build this consensus idea of what fun is, right? So, you know, a boss that, you know, uh, creates the mandatory happy hour and thinks he's the fun guy, you know, right. that's just, uh, we just need to change that, right? Um, but to your point, if you, you know, invite people in and say, hey, you know, I want to do this, I want it to be inclusionary, 
um, and I want us to have more fun on this project. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we, you know, to borrow from BJ Fogg, does that mean that we add, you know, some, uh, you know, milestone celebrations where, you know, we all do the hard work and then we go have fun together? Is that not your bag? Like, is it that, um, you know, we uh, develop opportunities for um, breaks so that you guys can have fun? Um, and then, you know, or can you add game mechanics to it, right? Like, I think, um, especially in the workplace, you know, really creating a delineation between pleasure and fun, um, where fun becomes this sense of mastery or completion, uh, you know, invites game mechanics into it, right? And so, you know, whatever that is, whether it's through rewards, whether it's through celebration, whether it's through um, building, you know, camaraderie, just, you know, because you guys are all on the same mission, um, you know, there's so many ways to do it. There's a lot, I think what's more important nowadays is what not to do, right? And that is to assume that everyone likes what you like <laughs> to your well, point. Exactly. And that's, that's exactly why when companies like, well, what are you going to do? I go, well, I need to get to know your employees. I need <laughs> to know them all. I need yeah. to do that deep dive and talk to them because yeah, for Sally, it's going to look different than for Jim and how do we make it work for everyone because you can't just put you can't just have beer on Friday and a ping pong table and expect everyone's gonna have fun yeah yeah some people are like are you crazy and I don't drink beer right, right? so yeah. I think that's super important to be able to identify what it's gonna look like for a certain organization or a certain cor corporation or, or or an individual or a family or whoever um, because that is different and I also love that because it allows for anything to be acceptable. It's like whatever you do fun in your life, maybe fun for you is having six hours of gardening a week. Yeah. Okay, that's not fun for me. That's work. Right. But that's important if, if we're able to um, allow and accept different people's idea of what fun is, right? And I think, you know, we're borrowing from, you know, the discipline of change management, but when you have something like that that is more inclusionary and you're asking folks you know for their opinion yeah. we know that there's better buy-in and um, people just feel better about it so in uh my uh, dissertation was on workplace wellness but it still applies like um, to your point if you have a practitioner that goes in and doesn't kind of pull things off the shelf per se you know and and uh, adapts things um you know uh things like corporate uh, social responsibility, CSR things are just so much more um, fulfilling and rewarding when people feel like they're a part of it, right? Um, yeah. You know, so like what is, you know, uh, you, you know, if you're in a, a faith-based organization, it might be okay to do something, you know, in, in that realm where if you were part of a bigger corporation that would fail miserably because, you know, um, that's not part of the DNA of that particular company. So I think the same thing applies for fun, um, you know, where, yeah, you know, like what is this group of people want to do, um, you know, and design something around that. Um, yeah, you know. yeah. Okay. So pretend for a second, I'm like a senior executive of a multi-billion dollar corporation and I'm a man, white man. <laughs> and I'm maybe like around 70 and I've been doing it for a long time pretty stiff and not really like open to these ideas. What would you say to me? I know I don't look like that, <laughs> but imagine what, what if you could say anything, if, okay, for just an inkling, I was like, okay, what's this about fun? Yeah. What, do, what would be the one thing you would, you would say to me to think about? Or well, we definitely know that the more the, you know, individual, um, can portray that, whatever that looks like, they're going to get better buy-in, right? Like, again, borrowing from the discipline of workplace wellness, it really does need to per be portrayed from the top. Okay, Bob. It, okay, wait, wait. Can you call yeah, yeah, Bob? Can you, can you talk to me like I am that guy? Can you be like, <laughs> Bob, this All is right, what I advise you to do in this day and age. Just for I haven't me. done role-playing since, since my uh, practicum work back in the day, so this will be fun. Um, <laughs> So Bob, um, do you, uh, you know, what, how do you think that you would instill fun in your organization? Were you going to ask me? Yes. <laughs> I wanted to hear your advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, as good, uh, um, as good consultants, say, right? I would say, Mike, I don't, fun is for my great 
grandchildren. I, I don't have fun anymore. <laughs> well, what, what, if you had an idea of fun, what would it be? For me, that would be getting together with my buddies and playing golf. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to try and have a little bit more fun within your organization. So do you, if you don't necessarily think you're the person to bring fun about, do you know um, folks that are considered fun that have spheres of influence within the organization that perhaps we could bring into the fold to, you know, figure out some good ideas to make, you know, fun a, a better initiative for your, uh, for your situation and organization? I think perhaps we need to hire someone else to provide <laughs> this whole idea because I have no idea what you're talking about, but if you're going to say it's going to bring me more money, let's try it. <laughs> well, it definitely will bring you more money. We know that uh, if your employees feel fulfilled and are having fun at work, um, that absenteeism goes down, um, that productivity goes up, um, and they will uh, work less hours but get a lot more done. So they'll also have fulfilling lives outside of the work environment. Yeah, it's, it's good. So we need to figure this out. Sounds like a good plan. Happier people, <laughs> more productivity, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like, you know, for the bobs out there, it's, it does come down to the bottom line, and it's about it's about the profits. But I mean, for me, I just I know I have lots of fun in life, and I would love to, you know, bring this mindset that you're talking about um, to more people's lives on the day to day. You know, so that we're not living for the weekend. So we don't think fun is just windsurfing on our two weeks holidays or going on a trip with our family, which is fun, but we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait till we're retired to have fun. Absolutely. Um, and I think you would agree, Mike, that um, just like the rest of our lives are built around habits, that fun can become a habit. How would you recommend or how, like, how would you maybe inspire somebody to make fun more of a habit? Because I think you had to do that when you weren't happy and you weren't feeling like it really. Yeah. Start doing it consciously and being aware. How would you tell somebody to start? Yeah. So the way I do it is again, that framework of 168 hours. And so I've created kind of a rudimentary model called the play model okay. um, where you, uh, you know, you look at how you're spending your time in any given week and put it in four categories. So either pleasing, living, yielding, or agonizing. Um, and all of them have, you know, kind of constructs. Living um, is really like the big things that we do, right? So if you're not having any fun at all, that's, you know, you can kind of park that one for now. But the idea is to see, you know, what in your life is, you know, actually pleasing and bringing you a little bit of joy. And again, if you can't find one or two things like that, you know, within your week, then you need to start, you know, do some work about, okay, what was it that was fun at one point, you know, or, uh, you know, if you can't figure that out, what is it if you're on social media or stuff that you sort of, uh, you know, I, you know, you identify as like, wow, I wish I could be doing that and figure out how you can, you know, uh, build in that time in your week uh, for yourself. And so once you do start to habitually, it, you, you're able to do that. Um, then you start to see the benefits and it becomes a snowball at that point, right? Where you figure out what's the right equilibrium because certainly then you can start to have too much fun, you know, and then that becomes <laughs> a statement, right? Like, I don't think I'm it's with my friends. <laughs> too many adults don't worry about that. Not <laughs> yeah. Much fun? But, I, mean, I guess a few do, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the thing is, I think once you understand, you know, sort of fun as an effective tool, then you can you know, start to bundle it in things like you suggested, like what are ways where I can make a mundane activity a little bit more fun, right? Yes. And there's some things that you can do and then there's some things that you can't do. Like when I was first getting into it, you know, we all learn from our own mistakes, right? And so one of the things I suggested early on was maybe you could bundle, you know, if you really enjoy like a Netflix series, maybe you could bundle doing your taxes with like you know, <laughs> watching a show. And, um, you know, I continue to reach out to, to thought experts myself so that I sharpen my own saw. And that is one way to actually make two things more miserable, right? And so there are some exclusionary, you know, aspects to, you know, making things more fun. Like a great way would be, uh, you know, if you're going to have, uh, you know, take some time for yourself during a lunch break, right? So, you know, you, uh, 
that maladaptive work behavior of working through lunch because you think you need to, yeah. you take lunch and you realize you're actually more productive in the second half. Right. You could potentially bundle that with a good friend that's not a work colleague, but say, hey, meet me for lunch. This is working for me and I'd like to see you and that's going to make this lunch more pleasurable. Yeah. Right? That's a, a great way to, you know, to use fun in an additive sort of aspect. Again, I took it too far and I was like, you know, because you could make like potentially yielding activity like vacuuming your house more pleasurable listening to music, right? And so I tried to expand on that. And unfortunately, um, you know, if you really like a show and then you're actually doing an activity that's fairly agonizing, um, it you start to, you know, uh, it, um, think and um, uh, you can make that show actually you know, uh, you ruminate on that experience as something that's, you know, negative and associated with the taxes. So. Right. Yeah, you have to be careful with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd like to take one step backwards because I think for you and I and many people, it's, we have no problem actually identifying what is fun for us. We're like, oh, I love swing dancing or I love getting on a plane and going somewhere new, or I love playing with my grandkids, whatever it is. But there are people I've spoken to, Mike, and I'm sure you've met some along the way that I asked them, what brings you joy? What, when, what is the activity you're doing that you're having fun? And they look at me blank faced. It's been so long for them that they are like, I don't even, I don't know. Yeah, it's unfortunate, yeah, it's, it's, and it's, so you're right, and it's common, right? So, what would um, you say to them? How do it, we find what elates us? Most of us in this space um, borrow an exercise from a gentleman by the name of Stuart Brown. Have you? He wrote a book called Play. Okay. Um, so basically, you know, you just need to do um, an audit of you know what it is that once did bring you joy, right? And so I call it a fun list, you know, and you. You just spend some time, however much time you need, you know, and write it down, you know, like, because people will say that, but when you're given that exercise, you know, they'll figure out things that, you know, at least once brought them joy, because it's very unlikely that they're still alive if they didn't have <laughs> any opportunities yeah. for pleasure throughout that time. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, again, to your point, it's so, uh, you know, um, individualized, right? So uh, the folly comes when someone gives you a list, like, oh, well, why don't you, you know, try horseback riding or, yeah. you know, um, like I, I always use this example. I'm, uh, for me, pleasure is high arousal, right? So I love like uh, heavy metal music or, you know, going to, they now call it dad rock, which kills me a little <laughs> bit inside, right? But like, you know, sound garden or tool, you know, things That's that I enjoy in the 90s. Um, my wife's idea of a you know, fun experience is um, sitting on the couch with a book because she's very low arousal, arousal and um, you know, doesn't enjoy rock concerts. So we figured out to do those two things separately, right? Yeah. And so the, the reason I bring up that example is you know, when you do that, you, you do it as your authentic self, right? Like you don't have to, well, yeah, but you know, as a, a dedicated wife and mother, this, you know, this would be fun, but I just, you know, I can't be on the list. Like you really need to sit down and figure out what that is. Right. And then you start testing it, right? You know, you start uh, putting in some experiences. I tend to say whittle down the list down to three um, because there can be the paradox of choice too, right? So you make a comprehensive list um, and then sort of figure out uh, what are the three that are, are that you could actually execute on, right? Like yeah. one on my list is going to space and I'm absolutely going to do that, but it can't be, you know, bubbled up to the top as a top three, right? Because right now it costs $200,000. So that's not a realistic goal, right? And so almost all of us now have been inundated, you know, with what the, the SMART acronym, you know, so that's mm -hmm. something that you could put against each one on your fun list. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, again, figure out what are those three that you could actually implement um, and do one of them in that week. And then, yeah, and it always primes the pump. Yeah, I think it's so important. People think too much. Don't stop thinking about it. Just do it. Yeah. If your idea of fun is getting a water gun and spraying your kids. Just do it. Yeah, that's, so. What's the worst case scenario? Pretty, that's another one. Interviewing all these folks, um, especially folks that had found themselves not having fun. Yeah. Uh, 
and you probably already know this, but if you put it on your calendar, especially for A types, it becomes immutable. So it's very interesting, right? Like yeah. if you talk about it and you're like, okay, well, I'll get to that on the weekend. But for yeah. some reason, those people that are stuck, if you're like, even if they, you know, are like, ah, yeah, it just seems contrived. Yeah. If, if they put it in their calendar, in their outlook, then they'll actually do it. And it usually only takes one or two fun things to go, you know what? Okay, I get it. Um, <laughs> And then another thing that if, the, if folks are really stuck, and I write about this in the book, um, mm -hmm. find that one thing, like something that just was really, really fun um, and put a totem on, you know, on your desk so that, you know, if you're yeah. like, I can't have fun, it's just a daily reminder that like, you know, at one point I could have fun, you yeah. know, and ultimately staring, you'll get sick of staring at it if, you know, you're not, if you're not you know, doing it. Yeah, so that's like one of the, you know, an amazing experience I had with my best friend. And I just keep it there. So if I'm not, you know, if I need a little uh, ounce, you know, or boost of resilience, you know, it's right there for, for consumption. Yeah. Well, I'm Bob and I'm going to go have go play golf because that's going to be fun for me. <laughs> um, I'm going to wrap up, but I, before we go, I do want to ask you, um, I, had, I do a fun, a fun fast round question. So sure, two sure. Minutes, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. And just answer them as fast as you can. Um, all right, are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay. All right, when's the last time you had a belly laugh? Um, it was about a week ago. Uh, yeah, the kids and I uh, will do silly things. And uh, yeah, we were laughing pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask the details on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. What's one thing you, what's one thing you love about yourself? Um, that I'm passionate. Yeah. Okay. You know, I think like e even when times are tough, I'm always able to sort of devise a strategy, um, you know, and, and take the next step, even if it's difficult. Um, so I like that about myself. Okay. That's great. Um, what would you say is the most defining moment in your life so far? Uh, well, as a husband, you always have to say, with the, <laughs> after getting married. Right? I don't want the should answer. I want the real yeah. answer. Uh, well, in the looping back to the previous one, um, I had set out a goal to do uh, an Ironman, um, and uh, I did it. Um, I was, I believe, the second last to finish. And uh, on, they have cutoff points where they tell you, you know, this just isn't your day, come back and do it again. And like, so each time I had strategically figured out how to do just enough to get to the next point where they would let me go. Um, and actually crossing the line, being one of the last people, it was in New Zealand. Yeah. And um, uh, because I was one of the last, like every spectator had you know, come to the finish line. So I felt like I was like winning because like, you know, <laughs> I felt like you were winning. That's yeah. <laughs> and they had actually re put up a ribbon and my wife, um, uh, girlfriend at the time, but now wife, you know, met me with a beer and a burrito. And uh, it was just like nice. knowing that I had done enough to do something fairly amazing like that has like sort of set the stage um, you know, for that ideology that I explained in the previous I question. That. I love mm -hmm. that. Okay, last question. What's the one band that you would rip your shirt open for and let them sign your chest? Oh, Beastie Boys, hands down. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I like that that was so easy for you. <laughs> Mainly because they are fun. Like, so if you ask me my favorite band, it'd be Soundgarden. And okay. unfortunately, oh, Christopher Nelson. Good concert. Good concert. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, the beasties are just like, you know, fun personified and uh, they're just, you know, and did so much and still to this day doing so much um, social good too, you know, um, and learn from their mistakes, you know, yeah. like obviously the misogyny from um, License to Ill, uh, you know, um, they needed to evolve and mature as men and they did and they, you know, so I just, I like everything they stand for. And to have their signatures all over your chest would be amazing. <laughs> it just be weird anyways. I think <laughs> oh man, it's been so great to talk to you. I'm going to call you Dr. Mike. And, um, Dr. Mike, where do we find the fun habit when it comes out? And where can we find more information and you online? Please tell yeah, so, me. Um, 
if you're into this kind of stuff, yeah, please um, visit michaelrucker.com and sign up for my newsletter. The book drops next year. And then I'm also playing on Instagram under the handle, The Wonder of Fun. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. All right. I'm Chief Fun Officer Rebecca Benendike. Talk to you soon.